So we have Sasha and Lucas. You can share your screen. So, oh, thank you. So Sasha Hoysen is currently a PhD student in the group of uh, Professor Marcus Miller in Aachen. And he works in the field of fault around quantum error correction. On top of that, he was visiting researcher at Institute for Quantum Information and Matter at Caltech. And Lukas Postler is PhD student in the group of Professor Rainer Blatt at University of Innsbruck. And he focuses in his research on quantum information processing applications in trapped ion quantum processors. So we'll have this nice joint presentation. Um, happy to hear what you have to say. Yes, thanks, Michael. Uh, thanks for the kind introduction and the invite to the seminar. Um, yeah. As you already said, Lucas and I will give uh, this integrated talk on this latest work that we uh, just put on the archive a couple of weeks ago called Demonstration of Fault Tolerant Universal Quantum Gate Operations. So the outline for our talk will be that I start off giving a really brief introduction into quantum error correction and fault tolerant circuit design that we use in this work. And then Lucas will go on to present you uh, some of the experimental results on fault tolerantly, fault tolerantly realizing um, our Clifford gates. And then I will move on to uh, completing the universal gate set that we demonstrate here on our logical qubits and show you the experimental scheme that we use for magic state preparation here. So let's, let's get started. Let's get me started by telling you uh, that much of the latest progress that we've seen in quantum error correction was fueled by the development of the stabilizer formalism. Uh, and the point of the stabilizer formalism is to actually maintain coherence in entangled quantum states um, exactly by not needing to actually measure the wave function and collapse the wave function. Just a very simple example is the three qubit repetition code where the logical information is redundantly encoded into three different qubits, just um, analogously to how one would do this in a classical code. And the logical state is then in this coherent superposition of a 0, 0, 0 state and a 1, 1, 1 state. Oops. So now instead of writing down the full wave function, we use the stabilizer formalism to fix the code space. Um, which is the simultaneous plus one eigenstate of all so-called stabilizer operators that describe the three qubit repetition code. These are here the Z1, Z2, and the Z2, Z3 operator. And on top of that, we have the logical operators that then fix the logical subspace, and they uniquely describe the logical zero or the logical one state. The code space is illustrated here in uh, these boxes on the right. They are these uh, two grayish little boxes over here that are labeled 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1. Um, and there are the uh, other possible states that can occur um, due to errors that might happen um, to this code state. Let's look at one example. It could be an X error on the first qubit that would take the 0, 0, 0 state to the 1, 0, 0, and the 1, 1, 1 to 0, 1, 1. So that would take us out of the code space. And just by measuring the stabilizer operators and not the, the wave function itself, we can obtain these expectation values. Uh, and then from these expectation values, deduce what correction we need to apply to um, transform the, uh, the state back to our code space. In this case, an x1 correction. So the code that we use in our work here is the seven qubit color code or the Steen code, which is the smallest instance of topological uh, color codes. It is a distance three code where seven physical qubits are arranged on this triangular structure that I drew here on the right. Um, and it has six stabilizers. The stabilizers are, um, they are weight four operators that are symmetric in X and Z on each of these. Uh, red, blue, and green colored plaquettes. Um, yeah, and the logical operators are just um, all uh, poly X or poly Z on all physical qubits. 
Uh, so by having six, stab uh, six stabilizers, we realize a single encoded logical qubit. Um, yes, and now let's look at uh, how in this code, uh, a single error can also be corrected. It actually looks uh, really similar to the three qubit code that I showed you before. Let's imagine we have a single X error happening on qubit number five. Then we would measure the expectation value of the first and third Z stabilizer as plus one, but the second one is violated and we measure it as minus one, which comes because that X error anti-commutes now with the Z5 operator here in, this, in, the, in the second Z stabilizer. Now measuring this syndrome would um, cause us as observers to apply the X5 correction and the X5 correction uh, squares to become the identity and thus the error can be corrected. So now in order to obtain these stabilizer expectation values, we actually need to measure the stabilizers. And you see here in the middle, um, the standard circuit to perform a measurement of a four qubit stabilizer. Now what can happen during the measurement of the stabilizer is that for example, here on this uh, physical qubit that's used to read out uh, the measurement value, a single Pauli Z error occurs. And uh, because of the error propagation rules, the, C -not, uh, the subsequent C0 gates, this Pauli Z error would first uh, spread here to the third data qubit, and then by the next C0 also spread to the fourth data qubit, thus in total causing a weight two error operator on our steam code, which is uncorrectable because the code has distance three. And this comes with the promise to just correct one arbitrary Pauli error, but not two. Yeah, and this, um, this fact that a single phase flip error results in an uncorrectable error uh, leads us uh, to say that this way to measure the four qubit stabilizer is not fault tolerant, but there's help this fatal error propagation can be prevented by just adding a single additional flag qubit uh, that is here somehow uh, interleaved with the, with the readout C nodes so that the single Pauli Z error will uh, also propagate to this flag qubit here and will then be measured um, as a raised flag or triggered flag uh, that we would say, uh, meaning that we measure this flag qubit in the, um, in the minus one state. So by adding this extra flag qubit, where we can detect a potentially dangerous error and discard the run uh, if a non-trivial flag is measured and thus ensure that uh, um, the prepared state is actually, will be fault tolerantly prepared. So let me stress again um, that this is exactly the thing that we mean when we say fault tolerant, it means that no single fault at any point in the circuit can cause a logical error, which is a little bit different from saying that we are operating below the code's threshold, which is not the case here. But that's actually not a big thing because this uh, fault tolerant circuit design principle will lead us to this advantageous scaling of the logical error rate as, uh, as p to the power of two for low physical failure rates p. Um, which is obviously advantageous towards um, over, a, over a single qubit or a non-fault tolerant preparation circuit uh, that would both scale linearly because there are single errors that can happen with probability P. So even if we're performing our experiment above the threshold by this advantageous quadratic scaling, we know that we might soon uh, be able to operate below threshold. And with that, I wanna hand over to Lucas. So thanks, Sasha. Um, hello and welcome also from, from my side. Thank you for the invitation to this uh, seminar. Um, so now I'm, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the experimental realizations of, of those uh, fault torrent uh, gadgets that uh, uh, Sasha described in, in the first part of the talk. First of all, uh, let me uh, tell you a little bit about the, uh, uh, about the experimental platform. So you already heard about the uh, trapped ion systems uh, from Claire, so I'll keep this uh, short, but uh, let me remind you about the most important things here. Um, so uh, we use uh, uh, calcium 40 ions. You see a string of, of trapped ions at the bottom of the slide. And if we zoom in into one of these a little further, we see this uh, simplified energy scheme where we uh, encode uh, a qubit in, in two electronic uh, states. 
the zero state is in, in the ground state, ground state uh, of the ion, the S1 half state, and we use a, a metastable um, long-lived state, uh, the D5 half state, the lifetime of a second to encode uh, the one state of the qubit. <clears throat> to read out the, the qubit, we use uh, another transition, transition between the S1 half and the P1 half uh, um, state, which is very uh, short-lived. So if we um, illuminate the ions with this uh, light resonant to this transition, in case the qubit was in zero, we get fluorescence light from this uh, cyclic transition and, and the ion appears to be bright on, on the camera. In case it would have been in the one state, it uh, would have stayed uh, dark. So we are uh, quite flexible in, in terms of uh, register sizes, um, as we can just uh, load the uh, different numbers of ions, but all the, the results I'm going to show you now are in, in a register uh, of 16 uh, qubits. Here on the uh, uh, top right, you now see the, the whole device. Uh, so everything is, is housed in, in two standard 19-inch uh, racks, as uh, all of you uh, know them from uh, uh, classical uh, uh, computation setups. So everything, electronics, lasers, but also the, the vacuum chamber uh, holding the trap, is in uh, those two racks. And uh, the native gate set that we, that we implement uh, is uh, consisting of three uh, main categories, uh, let's say. First of all, um, uh, rotation around an axis in the equatorial plane of the Bloch sphere, let's say X or, or Y rotations, which we can implement uh, by illuminating ions uh, with laser pulses resonant to the, to the qubit transition. And we can control the, the uh, axis, the rotation axis, uh, by changing the phase of this uh, laser pulse. Uh, secondly, we can do uh, virtual uh, set rotations. And uh, we do them by, by changing uh, the, the laser phases of su subsequent uh, pulses. So they are completely done in, in software. And therefore, let's say they are free in, in terms of uh, infidelity. And last, last but not least, we have uh, our entangling operations. So we, we implement uh, XX uh, operations uh, by using the mölner sorensen uh, interaction. Um, this uh, entangling gate is um, equivalent uh, to the CNOC gate up to some, some local operations. And that's why I, I show you the, the upcoming uh, circuits in, in CNOT notation, because uh, most of you are probably more familiar with, with the CNOC gates. The infidelities uh, we have in, uh, in this system uh, can be expressed by those uh, error rates you see on the bottom right. For single qubit gates, we have uh, five times 10 to minus three error rate. Uh, for two qubit gates, we have about 2.5%. Uh, and for initialization and measurement uh, of a single qubit, we have uh, three times uh, uh, 10 to the minus three again. Um, so let's get uh, right into uh, the Fulcher and uh, uh, Gadget uh, uh, stuff here. So Sasha already uh, showed you a visualization of the, of the color code. So this uh, colorful triangle you saw before. Uh, but now here on, on the left, you see the actual uh, circuit that we implement uh, in, in the lab to, uh, to encode or to create a, a logical qubit in, in the logical zero state. The first part in, in this, uh, a uh, box with the yellowish uh, label is a, a non falterant encoding part. So the, the logical qubit is already encoded. But then uh, in, in the second box, there follows this verification step. And, and this uh, follows this, this principle of, of flag falterance that uh, Sasha introduced. So every dangerous error, one of them is, is indicated there, will also propagate to the flag. And if uh, we, we measure the flag and see that uh, the flag is triggered, we just discard this experimental run and, and start over new. Um, to characterize the effect of this uh, uh, verification, um, we can have a look at the uh, right-hand side. So we have, here we have the, the occurrence of, of experimental outcomes versus um, the minimal hemming distance uh, to the closest uh, basis state that uh, is present in the ideal encoded state. But um, for, for now, we can put this uh, uh, on a level uh, of yeah, the, the error count, let's say, how many errors uh, uh, were occurring uh, during the encoding uh, uh, circuit. 
Um, and in the, the, the darker shaded bars are experimental results and the lighter, lighter shaded bars are um, results from numerical simulations. So uh, Monte Carlo simulations using a, a depolarizing uh, noise model with the error rates uh, that we also estimated from, from the experiment. You can see them again on, on the top right there. And um, the, the interesting part now is the, the one highlighted uh, with the red uh, ellipse here. So this is uh, the, those are the, the outcomes uh, with two errors, let's say. And now we see that uh, uh, if we had the verification step, so that the greenish um, uh, bars here, we can uh, significantly reduce uh, the occurrence of, of those uh, uncorrectable uh, weight to errors. So instead of uh, roughly 10% uh, uh, of uncorrectable um, outcomes, we have around 1% uh, here. Okay, so now we have seen uh, the logically zero encoding, but now of course we want to, to implement some uh, operations on this log logical qubit. And the first step would be to, um, to apply single qubit uh, Clifford gates so that we can prepare, let's say, the other uh, cardinal states of, uh, on the block sphere. You can see them on, on the right here uh, on this little block sphere. So it's the plus and minus uh, one eigenstates um, along the set y and x um, directions. And this we can do by applying the Clifford gate to the logical qubit. And um, this can be done by just applying the same, the corresponding gate to all the uh, underlying physical qubits, so onto this uh, seven uh, data qubits. And this property is called uh, transversality. So Clifford gates are transversal in, in this uh, color code that we use. And uh, on the right-hand side, you see the logical infidelity. So I want to uh, emphasize here that this is not the quantum state fidelity, but uh, the, uh, the logical infidelity uh, um, calculated from, from the logical expectation values that we measure. And uh, again, we see that uh, also for, for these uh, five other states, uh, um, apart from the zero state, we were able to uh, significantly reduce the infidelity by adding uh, this verification step. So we have a, a mean infidelity of uh, around a percent here uh, over all six uh, Pauli eigenstates. But uh, as I said, we have uh, a 16 uh, qubit register used here. So we are able to encode another logical qubit and uh, apply a, a logic C0 gate to them. So on the top left, you see uh, again, uh, uh, non fault tolerant encoding, then this verification step and uh, a single qubit Clifford gate for two logical qubits that we prepare at the same time in, in, in the trap. And then we apply the logical C0 gate to it. So on the bottom left, uh, you see how this uh, C0 gate uh, is implemented. As the C0 is also part from, uh, of the Clifford group, it's, uh, it can be applied transversely as well. So it means we, we just apply to pairs of corresponding uh, physical qubits of the two logical qubits. And here we clearly see that uh, a transversal uh, gate is uh, by design also fault tolerant because a, a single error can cause uh, at most one single error per logical qubit. And as the, the error correction step is done individually for um, both logical qubits, this is a, a still a correctable state. And uh, in, in the middle of the slide, uh, you see uh, results. Again, the figure of merit is, uh, is the infidelity here for us uh, for six different input states to this uh, logical C0 gate. <clears throat> and um, what you can see is that uh, for the last two input states where actually a, a bell type uh, output state is, uh, is produced, the infidelity is significantly higher, so factor four roughly. Um, and from the, from the uh, simulation results, you can see that this is partly supported by the simulation, uh, but not fully. So um, to, to understand uh, this will be part of follow-up work that we, uh, we will uh, start working on soon. On the right-hand side, you can see a reconstruction 
uh, of the of the logical spell state um, from from the logical expectation values. And uh, with this, I will hand back to Sasha, uh, who will uh, uh, tell you why this is not uh, enough to do a uh, universal uh, quantum computation, unfortunately. Yes, thanks, Lucas. Uh, that's, exa and that's exactly uh, where I want to pick up again, just by reminding you that um, a universal gate set is needed in order to do um, arbitrary quantum computations. Um, so, um, of course, the Steen code is a great code uh, because it realizes the whole Clifford group transversely. But unfortunately, um, we can't get the full Clifford group and a non Clifford gate uh, transversely at the same time. Um, when we're talking about non Clifford gates now, um, I want to choose the T gate um, to do so. We could, in principle, uh, choose different gates to do so, um, but you will soon realize why the T gate is my personal favorite. Uh, for that. I wrote this uh, T-gate down here for you already as a, a pair of a fall rotation about the y-axis. Uh, I want to tell you now um, how we use this one for uh, to, realize, to realize the logical T-gate. So the standard technique um, to do the T-gate is called magic state injection, which is done on the logical level with the circuit that I'm showing you here on the right. There, the logical magic state H is used as a resource state that's fed into a first quantum register. And then there's an arbitrary second logical state on the second register. And by performing a transversal controlled Y and measuring um, in the first register and applying a classically controlled rotation, this magic state mediates the performance of a logical T gate onto this arbitrary input state Psi L. So the question of realizing the logical T gate is actually moved to the question how we can fault tolerantly prepare the logical magic state. Because all elements in this teleportation circuit here are actually transversal, right? So the magic state that we use here in our work is the state H that I've wrote down here. And this is not kind of the, the, standard, uh, the standard magic state. Usually in the textbook, you will find the T gate as a power of a four rotation about the z-axis, but we chose the y-axis here because actually the magic state H is the plus one eigenstate of the Hadamard operator. And by, by exploiting this fact, we can use these flag circuits to fall tolerantly measure the Hadamard operator just in the same way as I told you uh, how to measure the stabilizers um, in the beginning to actually generate the magic state efficiently. So here I uh, wrote down now this three-step flex scheme uh, that we use for the magic state preparation. It starts out in this three high-level blocks, um, where in the, in the first block, uh, we perform the non-fault tolerant preparation of the logical magic state. Then as a second step, we do the measurement of the Hadamard operator using the flag circuits. They actually have two flags then. Um, and then in a third step, um, we follow by performing a full round of error correction that is used to detect residual errors. So then the result is uh, the logical magic state for tolerantly prepared. Um, and here it is on the block sphere again as a pi over four rotation uh, away from the logical zero state about the y-axis. So here I. Uh, wrote down again this three-step procedure, but now zooming into these high-level blocks to show you um, how these steps actually look like. And you can immediately see that by adding this second and third step to make the procedure fault tolerant, we actually introduce a lot of more uh, CNOT gates. So it's a much larger circuit complexity um, for the fault tolerant procedure than only having these 12 CNOT gates here needed for the non-fault tolerant protocol. Um, yeah, and it's quite amazing to me that the experimental guys in Innsbruck can uh, perform this protocol. And despite adding that much complexity, the logical infidelity actually after each step goes down significantly. Uh, we show you here 
in these um, three different colored uh, bar diagrams, the logical infidelity after each of these three steps, each time on the left, the experimental data, and on the right, the numerical simulations only using this very simple depolarizing um, circuit level noise model. Um, yeah, you can see by actually applying this procedure, the infidelity drops down by one order of magnitude from about 10% to about 1%. Um, with, um, of course, uh, with some throwout that comes from uh, these flags that get triggered because of the flag circuits that are about 60% during the Hadamard measurement and 10 to 15% during the um, error detection round. But that's not all. Um, as I told you, the purpose of preparing this magic state is then to inject it uh, to, the, uh, to this teleportation circuit to actually mediate the logical T gate. Uh, you can see this element here again on the right. And uh, we test this by, uh, I told you you can plug in arbitrary states, uh, but we tested it um, with four, four different logical Pauli states that we prepare in the same way as Lucas told you already uh, by having the logical zero preparation with a fault tolerant verification followed by a transversal Clifford gate. Um, and this is actually a really cool thing about the experiment that um, we can reuse the auxiliary qubits that we needed as flags in the magic state preparation to prepare the second, um, the second logical Pauli state. And I think I'm short on time. So this is my last slide um, where I show you the experimental and numerical simulation results on putting in these different logical states that are about 10%, uh, just slightly higher for the one and plus state due to the transversal Clifford gate and much lower for the plus I state since it's an eigenstate to the logical T gate, um, which yields a mean infidelity of about 10% in the in the experimental realization, um, yeah. And here on the right, you see the uh, corresponding process matrix that you can also check out on archive in our paper in more detail. So let me wrap up by summarizing our results. We implemented a universal logical T gate on the seven qubit uh, logical gate set. Sorry, <laughs> on the seven qubit color code using this fault tolerant circuit design principle, which we clearly see a performance improvement, although we introduce such higher complexity to the encoding and to the state preparation. And we can actually uh, qualitatively model the experimental processes with a simple generic theoretical model. Um, so yeah, just as a last word, I want to thank our, all our collaborators and acknowledge our funding. And of course, thank you for your attention and we'll be happy to take any questions that you might have. Awesome. Thank you very much. That was really great to see, you know, how this plays out in the in the real hardware. So, do we have any questions? If so, please raise your hand. Okay, then then I will start. So, one thing that I um, that one thing that like I think Lucas mentioned was that if we measure the flag qubit as being one, then we discard such calculations right so so first my question is like whether i understood it correctly it was slide 12 um i think and whether i understand it correctly and um whether like this sounds to me like we're actually not correcting the error in this case we are just kind of discarding the measurements that we are we we know are faulty so it's more like readout correction so could you comment on that? Yes, you're right. So we discard uh, those uh, those outcomes where the flag is raised, mm, but still we are able to, to detect them at least. And we are also working on a deterministic scheme to, to pre prepare the, uh, the logical zero state. So okay. it needs a, a little bit more, but, uh, but we are working on this uh, and uh, looks promising, let's say. Okay, awesome, awesome. Just wanted to make sure I, I got it right. So yeah. uh, David? You have a question? Hi, hi, Lucas and Sasha. Thanks for the great talk. Um, I have maybe a couple of naive questions. What, the first one, I guess, is just an experimental detail similar to, to Michael's question. So right, right now, are you 
doing the mid circuit measurements uh, on your flag qubits or, or any of the stabilizers or, or right now is this sort of, you do the full circuit and then you can post select on whether your flag qubit raised an error or something else went wrong? Um, so for the, the um, encoding of the zero state and for the magic state encoding, um, we only do uh, projective measurements at the end. Um, but uh, for the magic state injection, we actually do this in sequence measurement because we already uh, use uh, 15 qubits for the magic state uh, preparation. So seven data qubits and eight flag qubits. Then we uh, do an in-sequence detection of those uh, eight uh, flag qubits. And uh, in case they, they show the trivial result, so uh, the, the, the result we, we want to have, we know that the uh, flag qubits are in a, in a certain state and we can uh, reuse them for the encoding of the, of the target uh, logical qubit. So here we really do the in-sequence measurement and reuse the, the flag qubits. But apart from that, all the, the stuff uh, okay. we showed before is only done with projective measurements in the end of the sequence. Okay, great, great, thank you. And maybe just my follow-up question, and this is maybe just my, I'm not really an expert on, on these surface code uh, uh, circuits, but even if you can do, I guess, these mid-circuit measurements, in order for this surface code to be fault tolerant, you have a series of X stabilizers you need to measure and a, and a series of Z stabilizer need, stabilizers you need to measure. So you need to sort of do full tomography of all of the stabilizer qubits. How, how is that done on a single iteration of the experiment? It seems to me like you could measure, you could choose to measure the X stabilizers or you could choose to measure the Z stabilizers, but how do you measure both on one it shot? Is, it is enough to, to measure either or, or measure them sequentially, let's say. So, but. So let, let me start with this. You can you have both uh, possibilities. You can measure all of all six of them uh, at the same time with, with six uh, auxiliary qubits. Um, but you can also as X and Z is completely um, independent in this case. You can also measure them uh, um, uh, subsequently. So only use three auxiliary qubits. Measure let's say the X uh, um, stabilizers. Do your uh, corresponding correction then measure the set stabilizers and, and do another round of, of corrections. So you have uh, both options there and they're both possible. I, I see, so measuring X, if you choose to measure X, that doesn't destroy the information on that qubit about the Z stabilizer. Yeah, you're right, they're completely you, independent. You, you, you can do it in a non-destructive way. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Alba. That's Hi. the last question. Hi, thanks, thanks for this talk as well, and very nice. So I have maybe also a naive question. So you show the results of the fidelity when you generate a, a bell state with logical qubits, right? I think it was 75% or something, okay. So why is low in this sense? Because it's use, you use logical qubits, so I was expecting a better fidelity for a bell state, or is because you, know, you, involve, you need a lot of qubits and and there are other sources of error here that you are not correcting. Um, as I said, uh, first of all, it's a very complex circuit. Um, so it's uh, around 30 uh, entangling gates here. And mm -hmm. uh, as I said, it, uh, um, this increase of infidelity when we actually uh, create logical entanglement is partly uh, captured by the, by the simulation, but not fully, and, and we are, working on this to, to fully understand what is going on there. So it was higher than we expected, the infidelity, but we are uh, looking into this. Okay, maybe <laughs> thank Sasha you. I mean, I understand it's hard. No, it's, it's just that uh, I was expecting, you know, since you use logical, but of course there are many things that you should take into account and it's not a trivial circuit at all. So it's, the, it's still impressive, so. <laughs> Thanks. I mean, it's an interesting observation to see that apparently for these bell type states here, the infidelity is even much worse in the uh, numerical simulations um, than in the experiment, right? So it seems like we cannot fully attribute the um, infidelity to a lack of entanglement control or something. So what we've done is um, just a really short uh, estimation with just a very few samples in Monte Carlo simulations to look at uh, 
um, understanding the theoretical simulations a little bit better, um, where I've compared just uh, using ideal CNOT gates versus using faulty CNOT gates. Um, and you can see that even when using ideal CNOT gates, um, there's a significant amount of infidelity that still comes into play. Um, they are actually then in the same order um, than the full faulty um, circuits uh, that we use for the, for the computational basis states, right? Um, so this kinds of hints at that a large fraction of this infidelity just comes from the fact that the CNOT gate, even if it's ideal, just spreads different Pauli errors together that formerly would have been separated in the two different qubit registers. Okay, yeah, I see. Thank you. Thanks for your answer. Okay, great. Thank you very much for, uh, for the answers and for the talk once again. Um, thank everyone for coming. And hereby, we close the official part of this QRST.